All right. Well, there are probably going to be a few stragglers coming in uh, as we go, but that, I think that's part of what happens when you try to do this during lunch. Um, I want to start this off with a, a little bit of art appreciation. I want you to consider this piece for a moment. At, uh, at first glance, it's cute. It's interesting. Uh, to any of you who are parents out there, this probably looks like something that belongs on a refrigerator. Justifiably so, if you have kids and you've, they've held it up. Um, I want you to consider it now. This looks like a wall in a gallery. And even though it's the exact same piece, you start to look at it with a little bit more discernment. Um, you examine the color more closely. You're looking at the composition and you begin to try to maybe find some meaning in a piece that you wouldn't immediately believe was done by a 30-year-old chimpanzee named Brent. <laughs> I did this to point something out. There's a period of time when you are presenting any deliverable that you do, when you can do something to establish a tone, and that tone says that this looks like something that can either be easily dismissed or something that's important and worth examining. So for a brief moment, style is a bridge between uncertainty and substance. When you've done a piece of work and you hand it to someone, at the outset there is, before they understand what it is they've see, what they're seeing and they're getting, uh, you have a moment to make an impression to drive further investigation and further interest. So in the user experience space, you know, we got our stuff that we do, and this is not to be reductive because we do a lot more than this, but we, you know, we do a lot of wireframes, and we do a lot of persona, and we do journey maps, and we've got our portfolios are full of these very rich, very well-crafted, very dense uh, artifacts that we are justifiably proud because if they did their job, they help people understand something that they didn't understand before. Um, these, uh, you know, this is, this is part of our stock and trade. Um, but more specifically, they keep things moving forward. So I have a question for you. When you set out to create these artifacts? Do you go straight for your favorite digital tool? Do you jump into the Adobe Suite or Sketch or even Azure, uh, Visio? Or do you ask yourself this question? What's the least I can do to communicate an idea? What's the least I can do to get a message across? So a couple of years ago, I was doing some work for a large fast food chain. And um, I work in an agency that's famous for its lo-fi approach to the beginnings of projects. Our first deliverable is usually a short concept brief. It's got maybe five or six screens in it and they're done on a whiteboard and we sell that and clients buy into that idea before they even hire us. And this client thought that was cool and that was edgy and they were all on board. But something was bothering me because I knew that the information we gave them was going to have to be taken to other people who weren't in the room. And so I asked them, I said, Are you, think you, you think you're going to be okay taking design of this level of fidelity up the hallway to the senior VPs who are going to have to look at and approve this stuff? And I said, because I have some clients for whom that's kind of difficult. And they, were, and they said, oh, no, not us. Yeah, I didn't believe him. So I gave them the deck, and at first view, they loved it. They marched it up the hallway, and they came back and said, yeah, this is really good, but we've got, we've got one executive who kind of lacks imagination, and he can't seem to get his head around it. I was prepared. I already had a deck where I had substituted the sketches for photographs. I kept everything grayscale because I still wanted to make sure that they understood that design had not really happened yet, that this was still accounting for content and, and beginning to think about how content would be organized. And they took that back up the hallway and came back and said, yeah, we, everybody's all on board except for this one guy who just still can't see it. And so the next thing I did is I went and added color to the images. 
Now, I still made it clear that this was not final design, that, uh, you know, that, that kind of build out and that kind of uh, 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 finesse was going to have to come later. But this at least got them seeing their product and seeing it in, in this potentially new space, in this new context, and, and it worked for them. So this kind of starts to sound like a high pitch for high fidelity because, well, low fidelity didn't work, right? Actually, it did. Because the time we spent doing all of those sketches allowed us to get a whole bunch of ideas out there. We threw away a ton of stuff. We zeroed it down to three by the time we gave them those first sketches. And when it became a question of upping the fidelity, we only had to zero in on just those few things we'd done. And when it came a matter, became a matter of making color, that was just a matter of flipping a switch. If we hadn't done the low fidelity work first and really used up a bunch of ideas and thrown out a bunch of ideas and felt really good about the ideas that we did give them, uh, we would have been thrashing around quite a bit if we'd gone straight to high fidelity and had self-edited ourselves out of those ideas. We really might not have nailed this one. So ask yourself this question. We're in the job, arguably, of creating understanding. What is the least that I can do to get a message across? So this is a simplified version of an information transfer diagram. You have your artifact. Uh, it's being communicated through some means to somebody on the other end who's going to receive it and respond somehow. Along the way, we need to ask ourselves some questions. What's the goal? What's the, thing we're what's the problem that we're trying to solve? What's the thing? What's the thing we want to use to communicate, especially in the early stages of projects where we're trying to do a lot of stuff without a lot of risk? Are you going to be presenting it, or is it going to be going through a proxy? Is somebody else going to be doing it? And are you presenting to the person who has the approval power, or are you presenting, are you presenting to someone who's going to have to take it to that person? Each of these things represent uh, what results in signal loss. Obviously, person to person is the best way to, is the best way to demonstrate something. Uh, remotely, not so much. And if it's being sent and being uh, presented by other people, you've just added a whole bunch of steps. Signal loss is the thing, that, the thing that happens the more steps you have in between the origination of an idea and the demonstration of that idea. Um, how do you compensate for that? We're going to talk about this person right here. It might be a person, it might be people. But it comes down to knowing your audience. Well, no shit. We'd never heard that before, right? Okay, so stick with me a little bit on this. But we're going to talk about what you do and don't know about your audience. Um, and it also, this stems from having an understanding about the way people understand things. So hang on to the idea of there's this approver out there that we don't know much about. But there are some things that we can figure out. This is a model. It's a learning model called the VAK model, stands for Visual Auditory Kinesthetic. Um, it was originally designed to identify learning styles in schools. Now, for that particular purpose, it's kind of been debunked among the, the people in the education space. However, for what we're going to use it for and what we're going to talk about, it really works very well because we're going to talk about making sweeping generalizations. One of the things you find is you get a big enough sample set and uh, through a series of some fairly simple questions, you're going to find a distribution something like this. And what you're also going to find is that if you slice this, uh, uh, this triangle here, you've got this group of people down here and this group of people up here, is that this group of folks here that learn and understand things best in the visual and kinesthetic space tend to be a little more creative. The people that live over in this space tend to be the business owners. They often look at the world through spreadsheets. So when we're talking about more specifically what visual and auditory and, and kinesthetic is, visual is, as you might guess, a visually dominated learner. 
Okay, they absorb and retain information better when it's presented, uh, for example, in pictures and diagrams, charts, shape, sculpture, uh, paintings. Things happening in, in multiple dimensions tend to uh, work best for them. The auditory learner prefers listening to what is being presented. Uh, he or she responds best to voices. Uh, for example, a lecture or a group session, and hearing their own voice repeat something back also helps them. Uh, but they respond to listening, they respond to rhythms, they respond to tone. And so can you think of a communication method in business that's very popular that establishes rhythm? A spreadsheet. A fucking spreadsheet. <laughs> and these these are the people for whom the world makes sense when they're looking through that filter because there is a rhythm that goes on. You've got axes that are working, you've got common elements that are working along these axes, and you're seeing things moving in some kind of a pattern. So those tend to resonate quite well with the auditory learner. The kinesthetic dominant learner prefers a physical experience. Uh, she likes a hands-on approach and responds well to being able to touch or feel an object or a learning prop. Uh, they respond to gestures, they respond to body movement, they respond to object manipulation, positioning, how things are sitting in, in space. So you can determine how a person learns most efficiently, uh, most efficiently and the knock on this model has been that it tends to overstate how a person learns. The truth of the matter is that everybody can take in information and, and, and interpret it, whether it's visual, whether it's uh, 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 kinesthetic, or whether it's auditory, but they have preferences. They have, of those three ways, there's usually one that works best for most people. And we're gonna talk a little bit, we're gonna talk a little bit about how uh, uh, you can effectively build a persona to get an understanding of what that approver, what learning model that approver might, might speak to. So to my earlier point about pigeonholing students, these learning styles are not absolutes. Okay? People are capable of interpreting, uh, but they do have preferences. And what we're going to talk about is the more you can appeal to those preferences, the better chance you have of creating understanding. So this is how you reduce the signal loss. Can you find out the approver's name? Can you find out their title? If you know those two things, you can go out on LinkedIn. If you can, and if they have a LinkedIn profile, you can see what they did in college. You can see how they came up within a company. Did they come up through finance? Did they come up through marketing? If you, can, if you know just those things, you can begin to say something about which possible learning, uh, uh, learning model is, is going to be most preferential to them. Um, and again, we're talking about making generalizations here, but if you can, push for the kind of meeting that's going to benefit them, person to person, again, still being best. Uh, but what level of detail are you going to provide? Are you going to have handouts? Are you going to have charts? Are you going to have spreadsheets? Are you going to summarize as you go? Is there going to be activity that gets people up out of their chairs? Okay, so if you think about the learning styles we talked about, can you make some broad assumptions about what will resonate with them? Yes, you're absolutely making a generalization which could be totally off the mark. You might find yourself with a head of engineering who also has the soul of a poet and you're, you're gonna miss. But most of the time, most of the time, that's what a generalization is. Most of the time, you're not gonna be too far off the mark. So when I talk about knowing your audience, what I'm really saying is hedge your bets. Take the information that you have, take the context information that you have, see what that opens up for you and then begin to make some generalizations about what kind of approver you think you may be dealing with. So um, fidelity was what I was talking about before. What, what level of fidelity do you want to add to the artifacts that you're putting together? Do you go straight into your favorite digital tool or do you, you know, work lo-fi? Um, it can be characterized in different ways. And we usually think of it in terms of the amount of digital polish that we put into a document or how close we come to making something look like a finished product. 
Um, it can also refer to the amount of accuracy in your deliverables uh, in terms of the data or the detail. When you present something, this is where you check your scorecard against what you know. So maybe you got a wireframe deck and you're presenting to a person, uh, a product manager, who in turn will take this to the chief marketing officer. So you already know you're, you're dealing with a proxy here. Um, you discovered this marketing officer began her career as a copywriter. She studied photography and literature at the university. So you can determine that she's probably a visual learner. So her impressions weigh heavily on her perception of things initially. Uh, you also learn that the, uh, from the product manager, she's easily distracted. She often will ask questions before waiting, uh, before waiting for the answers to come in due course. And that tells you that she's probably pretty smart. Her mind moves faster than, her, uh, her mind moves faster than, than events are transpiring. Um, so uh, a, a lengthy presentation might not be the answer. But she's a writer, so detail is important to her. She may need something that allows her to go back and spend the time and, and, and set up the space around herself in an environment to really digest these details. So as you start to think about what you would do in this situation, um, the questions you make, the decisions you make about fidelity are important in both the short and the long run. So I like this quote. Um, John Jay, uh, I, caught, I, I got this out of a video, um, but he, he had this thing, this to say about uh, the tools that we use, um, that accessibility is a great thing, and at the same time, it's a hindrance, because higher fidelity doesn't necessarily make it a better idea. And why? So here's the thing. At the beginning, you want ideas, and I said this before, you want lots of ideas. Ideas that can be molded into solutions. High fidelity up front has a way of making yourself edit away from a lot of ideas. And it's important to throw a lot of ideas out there when you're, when you're uh, uh, without feeling too invested in them so you can throw them away and try others or start again. When you have these lovingly crafted, highly detailed documents, uh, these very finished looking artifacts, and you think you know, this is the gold standard of a solution, you're not as willing to discard it in the face of more information. And another reason is that sometimes stakeholders, especially uh, those who are focused on time, uh, believe that hi-fi artifacts like this must take a long time, which in the hands of someone with practice, it doesn't really. However, they look upon, they look upon time better spent maybe in development. And that perception contributes to the business managers figuring out, what, figuring out ways to keep UX out of the mix because they think, oh, we don't have time for those guys to, to do this stuff. And when they see the high fidelity documentation, they think, well, that's got to take a long time, too. That's where lo-fi allows the conversation to keep going. Um, I've, I've seen projects where uh, uh, project ma product managers would avoid UX completely because, and want to go straight to development, because real work's happening when people are writing code, right? So a little story here. I used to be a UX director with uh, a large travel company. Some of you may have heard of. Some of the, there are people in this room who were there for this event. Um, but we had a couple people who were so adept with a particular tool that they put a prototype together that was so finished looking and had so much interactivity that the stakeholders thought it was done. So imagine their surprise when we had to tell them that, yeah, this is just a prototype, and we had to walk it back and explain that this was not a finished product. Uh, it got, things got pretty ugly around this one. So in my next staff meeting, I handed out folios to everybody in the room, and I'm looking at one guy who was there for this. Uh, they had graph pads, they had Sharpies, they had Post-it notes uh, in a protractor, and this is what I told them. So I'm not gonna tell you where to finish up, because just like the hamburger example, the situation drove the need for fidelity up. Okay, we, we took the information that we got as we got it and we ratcheted it up to fidelity as we needed to. We might not have needed to. So I won't tell you how to finish because the situation will drive it, but I will absolutely tell you how you're gonna start. This is your first prototyping tool. 
And from that point on, I didn't want to hear that people were diving for their, diving for their straight digital tool. I wanted them to begin lo-fi. So let's talk a little bit about lo-fi and hi-fi. And uh, I, I know at this point, just based on the things I've shown, some objections are coming up in your minds as to whether or not you can do that, because that's kind of a pretty good drawing of a hamburger, and I may not be able to draw a hamburger. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But first, I want to talk about something called working in public. Now, where I work, we have white wall, whiteboards everywhere, floor to ceiling. Uh, and it's not just so that we have a lot of whiteboard space and can draw stuff and have conversations, but it's because it puts us out in a place in public where as we're putting ideas on a whiteboard and we're getting these ideas out there, we're subject to drive-bys. Anybody walking by might join in that conversation. They might have experience in that particular industry or they might have seen something fairly recently that was kind of a cool animation. Uh, and, and this can be another designer, this can be a developer, this could be somebody in QA. I mean, you think about it, people in QA have worked through the smallest details of God knows how many different apps and they've seen the things that work well and they've seen the things that haven't. So uh, you might not immediately think of that as a place to go for elegant ideas, but let me tell you, I've got some great ideas from QA and definitely some of the most uh, uh, salient things I've seen in apps that I've designed originated with the developers. By working in public, they're able to join the conversation. So when I first started working there, I hadn't quite grasped that concept. I had my notebook, I had my moleskin, and I would sit there and I would work out my sketches and things like that, and then I would translate them into uh, 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 some, some other digital format uh, and, and develop these things that I called mock-offs. They, they had such a high level of fidelity, they looked like comps finished design, uh, when the truth is they were wireframes. And I maintained all the time, yeah, you know, you can want these up and throw them away. But again, people were reluctant to do that after they saw the work that had gone in, or the work they thought had gone into it. Anyway, one afternoon, I was sitting on one of those little beanbag things, and I had my moleskin in my lap. And the, the, the ironic thing about it, and it didn't dawn on me at the time, was that there was a perfectly pristine whiteboard wall behind me. And you have to understand, where I was working, this was, this was prime. I mean, finding whiteboard space that you could use was, was a tough thing to do. And this thing had just been cleaned off. I don't know who had done it, but the room was empty. And I went in there, and I sat down. And I was sitting there with my moleskin. I was trying to come up with ideas, and it really wasn't working. And the more I was working, the more tight I was getting. And I was getting all scrunched up, and I was not, things were not cooperating, and things were not working. And one of my colleagues walked in, and she asked me what I was doing. And I told her. And if she'd have had a rolled up newspaper in her hand, she'd have hit me with it. <laughs> what are you doing? What the fuck are you talking about? Get up. She threw a whiteboard marker at me. And she'd start, start take your first idea and let's put it up here on the wall. And then she started riffing off of what I was doing. And then other people sort of kind of wandered in and wandered out. And within about two hours, we had this wall covered with probably 30, 40 different concepts, which put us in a great place in terms of how we felt about the three that we took forward. You need other perspectives when you work. It, no one is immune to cognitive bias. And somebody may have experience or a viewpoint that, uh, that you lack. And those viewpoints add facets to an experience that you're trying to create. Now, this may seem counterintuitive, especially given a number of, don't do that. But given the number of, of, of introverts that we have in this community, uh, when you're standing at a whiteboard with others, it becomes easier to say that, uh, you know, this, this may be a really stupid idea, but I'm going to go ahead and throw it up here because there's not a lot of investment there, it, a square and a couple of circles. Um, so it actually, there actually, it wouldn't make sense at face value, but there is, le there is uh, uh, less inhibition when you're working publicly and working with other people and trying out goofy ideas. When you see that other people aren't afraid to try their goofy ideas, it's easier to get your silly ones up there too. And while the idea may actually be stupid uh, as a whole, there may be some kernel of that that gives somebody else an idea that takes it into something that's more elegant. And then it's about quantity you get more ideas. 
Um, truth is, when I started uh, my current job five years ago, I was really intimidated by what I saw. I walked around the building and I saw these, these, these beautiful whiteboards and all the work that these people were doing. And at the time, as a designer, I still held myself out as uh, the last design skill I still held as my own was cartooning. And I immediately was intimidated. I went home, I bought a whiteboard, I bought a set of pens, I practiced my handwriting, and I worked in secret until the next time came up when I needed to be able to do some stuff on a whiteboard. And I was able to, uh, I felt much more confident going into that. Because honestly, it's been five years. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the senior strategists in this company. I'm still intimidated by the work these guys do. And I have ripped them off shamelessly. I have looked at the techniques they use, and I, 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 I draw from that stuff all the time. Um, Can I ask you a question? Like, what if, the, what if you work somewhere that isn't set up like that? How would you go about creating this sort of public space? I would try to build that space somehow, if it, even if it were covering a, word, a wall with flip chart paper. So uh, even if it... Uh, so it's not necessarily a whiteboard and doesn't have the same distinction as a whiteboard. Flipboard paper can also be just, you know, if you don't like it, tear it down, wad it up, throw it away. Because you, you still, by doing that, you still have what is important, which is the fact that this is low risk design and needs to be disposable. But also by doing it on flip chart paper, you have it to keep and you can transport it, which you can't necessarily do with a whiteboard. But I, I would try to find a way to uh, create an environment that has people up out of their chairs and gives people a view into what you're doing. Um, that said, I've also had students in the past that couldn't do anything better than stick figures, but they could do them so well you understood exactly what they were talking about. So it's not about having beautiful sketch skills, and we'll talk a little bit more about that because uh, a lot of you are probably saying, well, I can't draw. So my response is, yes, you can. And the reason that I know you can is because anybody in here who can pick up a pencil knows how to write. And if you can write, you can draw these symbols. And this is a vocabulary. The reason we can write is because we have, we have uh, the glyphs and we have a vocabulary that we can use. And uh, courtesy of Dave Gray, who you're gonna see some of his stuff in this. Uh, I, I got a love, lot of love for this guy and the things he thinks about. Uh, this is a, a, a blog, uh, post that he did, and the whole thing is done basically in pen, uh, but there's a vocabulary for you. Or there's, there's, a, there's an alphabet, and here's a vocabulary that combines those pieces of that alphabet. Now, you're not going to do this overnight. It takes practice, but let me ask you this. When it comes to the tools that you use, you would spend the time and the learning curve to learn how to use a piece of software. Well, here's a tool that doesn't have licensing agreements or updates, and it's a hell of a lot easier to carry around than your laptop. So, yes, you may be sitting there saying, I can't draw. I'm saying that you can, but I'm also saying you need to spend a little time at it to get good at it. Because you would spend the time in other ways to get good at other things. So, what are the best tools? There's a lot of blog posts out there and a lot of listicles. I love that word. Uh, that have, you know, the top ten and the top five tools and all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, let me tell you about tools. Fuck the lists. These are your best tools right here. Your brain and a practiced hand. And by practiced hand, I don't mean the ability to sketch beautifully. I mean whatever tool you will ultimately use to finish your designs that you're good enough at that you don't have to think about the tool. You can think about the problem that you're solving. Wherever you have that practice. I'm saying extend your skill set. Practice other things too. Get to this point. But at the end of the day, there's not magic that comes out of being able to use Sketch App if you don't have these two things going first. These are your tools. So I talked at the beginning a little bit about you know, the usual suspects, the, the wireframes and the journey maps and, and, and that kind of stuff. And all, most of the time, those suit the situation just fine. But don't give it yourself in a situation where you have to, where you've got this sort of 
collection of things that you do and every problem that you run into, you try to shove into that set of solutions because it may not suit. Be open enough to look at what's going on in the situation and come up with ideas that suit the situation. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, the first, uh, the fir first the point I want to make is that there is no recipe for what we do. And I run into people all the time that feel like there must be and they want to know what it is and that we all work from it somehow. Well, we don't. A recipe is a list of fixed ingredients and a set of instructions and if you follow those instructions faithfully, uh, for the most part, you're going to get uh, the, uh, the similar or same result every single time. Well, every project is different. The outcome is different every single time. So when you got your recipe and all your fixed stuff, that's great, but projects are giant hairballs full of variables. And those, and those variables are different every time. So sometimes the artifacts you come up with and the ideas you want to present need to suit the situation. The situation isn't always going to suit your little arsenal of artifacts. So internally at work, I was given a talk and we're talking about personas. And we've been doing them there, uh, more specifically, we've been doing uh, proto-personas. Personas, by uh, definition, usually involve a lot of data and a lot of research, certain level of ethnography. Uh, proto-personas tend to be a little more an anecdotally driven. Uh, you're sitting with clients, people, you know, the marketing guys who understand their clients very deeply and you're trying to extract it there. Maybe you're lucky enough to get out into the field and, and, and observe people doing the things that you're trying, you know, so trying to solve the problems that you're going to help try to solve. Um, but we've been doing it this way for about five years and it works pretty well. Uh, I would draw a picture, I would always give them a real name. We'd say a little bit up front about their age or education uh, because we do primarily native mobile apps. Uh, we want to know about the technologies that they use. Then it becomes a matter of trying to define them, unique insights. What can we say about this person that makes them fairly unique? Because even though we're talking about a person, we're really talking about a group of people. So what are, what are earmarks of these people that we, might, that we might identify? What are their basic expectations for this app that we're going to build? What are the table stakes? What are the things that have to be there or it's not worth the trouble? What would disappoint them? What, if, if, if you did something or didn't do something within this application, what would be a big disappointment to them based on what you th think you understand about them. And last, what would make them really happy? This is where you get to talk about the really cool stuff. And understand you're doing this at a time in a project, ideally, where constraints and platforms and, and environments aren't yet part of the conversation. You want to set aside a little time where the laws of physics don't count because that hinders ideas. You start driving towards the solution that you already have or the platform that you already have. It's gonna come crashing in soon enough. You're gonna to have to count for it. But you'll wanna have just a little time where there really is no gravity and cool ideas can be aired out. Because you're doing this lo-fi, you can do it very quickly. You don't have to render something very complex in order to communicate what that idea might be. So it can be very abstract at this stage. So many of you have probably seen this. It's making the rounds. Uh, again, Dave Gray's work. Um, he created this empathy map a while back and recently gave it a reboot with some additional information. But I thought, you know, when we do these exercises with the personas, part of the problem that we have is that is they have a tendency to be kind of two-dimensional. We also judge the crap out of the people that we do personas for. I was working on a project that involved uh, a, a vaping device, and so our personas all smoked. And it's very interesting how easily it, came, it became for one of the persona to be a sleeveless t-shirt wearing flip-flop, wearing gimme hat, wearing you know, beady-eyed, chain-smoking kind of guy. I know a lot of people who smoked, and they don't look like that, and they don't act like that. <laughs> Okay, but we tend to build these kind of two-dimensional biases. And so I thought, what if we could get a little bit more into the head of the people that are doing this stuff, the people who are going to represent the, the people that we're designing for, and we spend a little time exploding that unique insights portion. So this is an existing exercise. 
Persona development is an existing exercise. But my recommendation here was to mash them up, and so we're doing that now on, on uh, you know, as of a couple of weeks ago on our recent projects. So different doesn't matter if it works. It doesn't have to be straight out of the canon of artifacts that we know and love in user experience. So some quick characteristics of lo-fi. Um, the first thing is that they are, and, and take, these, take these as understandings, uh, as, as an understanding of, of what they are, and then I'll talk a little bit about the benefits. But first, they are, by definition, partial. Okay? They're deliberately incomplete. And there's a lot of gaps that need to be filled, and everybody understands that as they're doing them and going forward. They also evoke emotion. They make it easier to connect with an idea. Um, they're temporal. I mean, just about everything we do in the digital world is temporal. Um, but they're obviously impermanent. So they're also human, because they're the things we make with our hands, there's a warmth to that. That comes through, even on a whiteboard. So that's all great, but what are the benefits? The first is efficiency. You're talking about quicker work cycles, getting ideas out, moving on or off the table. Uh, uh, and also, people aren't reluctant to correct them because, because of the, the, the characteristics. They are low because they are low fi They're also democratic because if you are working in public, then they support collaboration. Oops. Um, They are also, and I can tell you from my own experience, very liberating because they focus the attention on the idea, not on the constraints of the platform, not on the outcome. It's not the execution, uh, or I should say, it's the execution that adds constraint too early. Like I said, we're trying to play in a space just for a little while where we're suspending disbelief, knowing that the constraints are going to enter in soon enough and we're going to have to deal with them. But we may stumble upon something, or we may come up with an idea or a concept that as an outcome is something worth really working to, working to do. We may have a stupid idea for how to get there and have to work harder to figure out how to make that happen, but we've seen the value in the outcome and we want to make that happen. They're also story friendly. People understand things through narrative. Uh, we're tuned to stories. And they're also, uh, uh, a story is a little easier thing to defend later on as opposed to disparate ideas kind of mashed together. So another quick point. Uh, I know it seems, especially when you're putting presentations together for, uh, uh, for clients, that um, it seems like this really good idea to put a slide deck together or, or do your artifacts and add a lot of additional information because there's this uh, uh, the idea that there are going to be people who aren't in the room, or there are things that you want to leave behind. Uh, so you want, the doc you want this to work as a document in that sense, but you also want it to work as presentation material. Don't do that. Come up with separate versions of things, even for this talk. So you've seen I've got, a, not a lot, but a few little fades and builds in this thing. They're going to wind up out on SlideShare, and before I do that, I'm going to make an entirely different deck that takes out all of those builds and puts the notes in the right place so that you can go through them in that medium as a readable document. In some cases, I'll take my speaker notes out and I'll write a Medium uh, article to go with them. But as you try to do double duty, kind of like the Swiss Army knife, you wind up with something that kind of does a little bit of a lot of things, but none of them really great. You want to be really great with these things if you can. So if you're putting a presentation together, do a really good presentation, but don't try to make it have a foot in two camps and be both a presentation and a reading document for later on. Do a presentation for presenting. Do a reading document for later on. And one of the last things I want to say is that uh, if you've looked at, this, looked at these slides and looked at the fact that they're all done on whiteboard, it goes back to uh, you know, the chimpanzee painting. I did this just to show you that how you wrap something up can help you spend more time on the idea and the concept and less time worrying about the window dressing. But the window dressing, the fact that it was whiteboard, 
maybe interested you a little bit and got you to stick around long enough to find out what the story was about. So make sure that there's a lot of imperfection here, but if it looks like I did it on purpose and I put myself forward as having done this this way on purpose, you can get people into the thinking that you need them to be uh, that you need them to be in with you while you're coming up with concepts and coming up with these ideas. So at the beginning, ask yourself. This again runs maybe counter to what uh, you know somebody with a good work ethic would ask themselves. But what is the least you can do? If you can get away with a set of hand-drawn wireframes, and that communicates the idea to everybody in the room, and the heads are nodding, and they all get it, guess what? You've done the wireframes. You may find out that it's not working, and you've got to ratchet the fidelity level up a little bit, and maybe a little bit more, depending on who's going to see it. But take those cues to make those decisions. Don't go straight to the end game, which would be the, 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 the mock-offs. Compensate for signal loss. Do a little homework. It doesn't take a lot. But if you, like I said, if you could just find out a person's name and, where the, and their title where they work, you can, thanks to the internet, you can check them out on LinkedIn and you can learn some things that would tell you about what kinds of things may resonate with them and what kinds of things may not. It's all going to communicate to them, but can you line up what you're doing with what you can perceive as their, pre what you can understand as their preferences? Fidelity based on, or uh, hedging, hedging your bets, that's what that is. So uh, fidelity based on need. Back to my first point. Ratchet it up as you need to. Make the, make the decisions about what you need to communicate. Ratchet up the level of fidelity as you need to because if lower fidelity, particularly when you're still trying to get a lot of ideas out and get those nailed down, is going to get you uh, a, a whole lot further. It's also going to invoke a lot more conversation. When I talked about the characterizations and the benefits of lo-fi work, uh, it, it's a lot of those are, are very specific and unique characterizations you don't get when you start off with digital designs. Lo-fi to hi-fi and working in public. Get other perspectives because you've heard it a million times, you're not your user. At the same time, all the best ideas don't live up here, and you're going to be given perspectives from other people that are going to take you in places you wouldn't have even thought to go. And it rounds out your work in a, in a, in a, in a, in a much more holistic way. And do what suits the situation. Okay, don't say, okay, well, I'm going to start doing my wireframes now. If wireframes aren't the thing that's going to communicate the idea that you need to communicate or communicate to the people in the way they need to be communicated to. Don't be afraid to mash up ideas. Don't be afraid to invent artifacts. Uh, my, my work product, looking at, uh, I was digging into some, uh, I, I had a hard drive die on me, and you're gonna laugh, but I had a whole lot of work product that was still on zip disks. <laughs> and I still have my USB zip drive and I was able to retrieve all this work while my wife mocked me the whole time. But I said, yeah, mock me now. I've still got my stuff. <laughs> but as I look through that, there are hundreds of artifacts that didn't exist before, haven't existed since, because they were suited to what I needed at that time. And last of all, whatever you do, do it on purpose. Even if some of it, even if some of it is an accident, in truth, stand it up and own it. There are no accidents. Make, make it, uh, uh, you know, own it and make it uh, what, the, what, what the work is about. So keep this idea when you're thinking about style at the beginning of projects. That style is a promise. It owns that space right at the beginning of a communication uh, uh, relationship. And if it's done well, it's going to get people to take a bigger look. And if they take a closer look, and if they don't find substance, they're going to get pissed off. So style is your promise, and substance is that promise kept. Thank you. <laughs>